Hello, and welcome to lecture number one of the Sociology of Hip Hop. I'm really excited to get into this stuff um, with you um, and throughout the semester. Um, this first lecture, we're going to be covering some classic concepts in uh, hip hop scholarship and some big picture, important big picture um, theories in sociology. So I'm also really excited to get started in this because this is the first class I've ever taught. Uh, I realize that this is a kind of a weird <laughs> time to start teaching, but luckily I, you know, have some familiarity with how to put together a video and make audio <laughs> sound pretty decent. So hopefully that will enhance your experience throughout this semester. So before we get into it, I do hope that you have had a chance to go through uh, each of the three readings for today, so you can kind of have a sense as to where we're going. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. So this course brings together two disciplines. The first one is hip hop studies. So this is studying hip hop by any means necessary. So it's uh, one way to consider that is the multidisciplinary study of hip hop. So this means that scholars might draw on a variety of different perspectives or um, in you know a single research article or maybe just throughout their career. Um, on a baseline level, hip hop studies documents hip hop culture. So this could be an oral history of block parties or it could be, you know, uh, more recently say scraping um, a bunch of album reviews so that you have like all of the album reviews published by Vibe from some year to another year and that can be, you know, just uh, something that can be archived and things like that are valuable um, in their own right. Though beyond just documenting aspects of hip-hop culture, hip-hop studies scholars generate knowledge about hip-hop culture. So this kind of means in the sense that data don't really speak for themselves, even though these album reviews say a lot of things. <laughs> Um, you know, you might, you need uh, somebody to come through um, to analyze them and generate knowledge about that. And that can be in the form of, say, a really good concept, which ties, thing to, ties things together, or maybe um, an important comparison and contrast, um, or other things like that. I realize this might be a bit vague right now, but as we go through the class, uh, we'll be putting more kind of empirical flesh on these, these vague sort of big picture ideas, or big picture ideas which might seem vague to you right now. And like I mentioned, it uses any suitable scholarly or scientific tradition to study hip hop. Um, you can think, you know, when, when hip hop was first emerging, we didn't have like the internet and smartphones. So a lot of the, um, you know, things that were happening back then, we can't really study by just going on the internet and Googling. We might have to go and interview people or we might want to study some sort of historical period by, say, for example, the murals which people um, paint in various neighborhoods or, or something like that. Um, so again, studying hip hop by any means necessary. Sociology of hip hop, on the other hand, is specifically drawing on social scientific methods to understand hip hop, to study it, to generate theories about it. Um, so it generates sociological knowledge about hip hop culture in that sense you can kind of think as of the sociology of hip hop um as within hip hop studies because like i said it's a multidisciplinary study of hip hop so some sociologists who have studied hip hop might consider themselves a hip hop scholar although some sociologists just might consider themselves a you know for example a cultural sociologist who just wrote a paper <laughs> focusing on some aspect of hip hop so there's gen gen various ways of uh, approaching that, but they're kind of embedded within each other. So beyond just generating, you know, sociological understandings of hip hop, the sociology of hip hop also kind of uses rap lyrics or other um, conventions from within the culture to advance its own theories. And we'll see more examples of this throughout the semester. Great, so that's kind of just like a general overview of these two big picture disciplines um, or strategies of studying hip hop. Um, we'll get uh, more sp specific um, very soon. Um, but from this point, um, what I wanna do is give you some background on the emergence of hip hop. So like the historical context of the emergence of this 
cultural form, the musical genre, the dance, uh, the visual aspects, including, you know, graffiti. Um, and then we're going to cover two of the core concepts we're going to be returning to throughout this class. The first one is Black Noise from Trisha Rose. Um, in reading that book, I realized that that might not be... Um, the concept might not be super intuitive, so we'll be talking about that. And Jennifer Lena's concepts of um, genre forms and trajectories and what distinguishes them. So if we want to understand the basic features of hip hop culture and where hip hop comes from, we need to back up and go to the 1970s and 1960 or sorry, 1960s and 1950s America. So the first concept I want to cover is black nationalism. This was really important in 1960s America and is associated with groups like the Black Panthers um, and people like Malcolm X and Huey P. Newton. Um, so Black nationalism involves kind of generating solidarity among African Americans, um, you know, African Americans in the U.S. in order to have, in order to achieve economic and cultural freedom. So, what does this mean? Economic dependence and economic independence. You know, what's the difference there? Being economically independent means having enough money to, you know, make decisions about where you're going to live. Um, and just kind of having those basic freedoms. So what's a complicating factor that gets mentioned in the Watkins article is that being able to achieve some sort of economic freedom in the sense of, you know, maybe achieving a middle class status or even upper class status among African Americans of the time is often overshadowed by race. So even though you're rich, there's, that doesn't cancel out the racist social structures that are around you. Um, I think I'm going to refer to this a couple times, um, so if you have a, the ability to see it, it might be uh, insightful. Um, I just saw it recently, the, this movie that came out on Amazon Prime called One Night in Miami. It uh, is basically the story of where Sam Cooke's song, A Change is Going to Come, is uh, it kind of tells the, the where that song came from um, while talking about... Um, while also kind of engaging with themes about the tensions between, uh, you know, African Americans of the time seeking economic independence, while also kind of being dependent uh, in, in the sense of the cultural industries of the time. Um, so, you know, if you want to be, um, if you want to be developing your own culture, which was an, all, another aspect of black nationalism, because it's kind of saying there's this black identity in the U.S., and it's, you know, it, black people in the U.S. all experience the same kind of um, disadvantages, like I was saying. Like, even if you're rich, that doesn't cancel out <laughs> the racist structures that it, impact your everyday life. So by seeking both economic independence and cultural independence, um, this movement was kind of seeking its own nation within, like a black nation within uh, the U.S., so obviously that can be a bit complicated and fraught with tensions and um, as you read in the um, Watkins article. So in kind of talking about that political attitude, uh, Watkins was able to draw these connections with these political sentiments of the time um, with the kind of popularity of public enemy uh, among a, a large variety of, um, you know, African American um, students. I think he was mostly talking about was like um, engaging with like these middle class um, black adolescents. Like, what explains why they're so why they're so engaged by the pol politics of Public Enemy? And he goes back to this context to explain it. So that's kind of like the political atmosphere that was happening in the uh, 1950s and 60s. You know, the civil rights movement was going on then as well. So all of these kind of political factors uh, mixed together played into what was going to become the kind of main political thrust of this hip hop culture. We'll get more into that shortly, but so I want to back up and go even, I want to back up even further and talk about the emergence of jazz. So, and I want to talk about the difference between how jazz emerged 
and how uh, rock and roll emerged and what R&B really is. <laughs> so, um, you know, bla uh, jazz, jazz is a black musical art form. Um, and while it was like a struggle and devalued <laughs> for a lot of its um, initial development, it did eventually become kind of like the highbrow American art form. Um, and this was before rock and roll came around, which um, was, you know, the music of generally white men making music that had resistant messages, typically about uh, generated by like class differences. Um, and this was enabled by um, what some scholars have called like trickle down technological advancements. So as technology advances, people from um, you know, lower socioeconomic classes can access higher forms of, uh, or more advanced forms of technology, which is kind of what happened with rock music, um, access to, you know, like electric guitars and, and things like that, the um, made it more accessible to uh, a, a larger audience. Um, so, and then the third genre I just want to mention is R&B. So R&B is both a genre and it's kind of historically been a catch-all for African-American music. It used to literally be called race records <laughs> um, on the billboard charts. And I've included a uh, podcast, which will kind of give you some background on that. But all that to say is that leading up to hip hop, there was a genre which legitimated um, black cultural art forms, jazz, there was an art form which was based on technological advancements and resisting power structures of the day, rock and roll. And there was a kind of popular black art form, which was the R&B charts. Um, and it went through a, a, a handful of different names. And so what I, why I wanted to talk about that is because hip hop blends all of those things together. Obviously it took a while for it to become a legitimate kind of cultural form, a lot of resistance from white America. Um, but it does manage to combine all of these genres and this kind of political context from the 1950s and 60s. Okay, so moving from the 1960s into the 1970s is often called the post-civil rights era in the US. So, you know, what that means is that after these kind of huge wins um, on the political stage against racial inequality, um, the cultural and social context of the U.S. changed. So while, you know, the ideal was to achieve racial equality, unfortunately, what scholars like to refer to this as is the switch from color conscious racism to color blind racism. So sociologist Patricia Hill Collins put this really well um, and talking about, um, you know, the experience of African Americans living through the 1970s. She writes, during this period marked by the end of the black power movement and the ascendancy of hip hop, they lived the shift from a color conscious racism that relied on strict racial segregation to a seemingly colorblind racism that promised equal opportunities yet provided no lasting avenues for African American advancement. So again, to kind of link back to the Watkins article, there are some kind of um, new opportunities for African Americans in terms of, say, the labor market and to the ability to achieve, say, a middle class status. But again, that doesn't cancel out the historical legacy of racism in the US. So unfortunately, um, it just kind of drove the clear race, the, the the clear social cleavages between racial groups in the US, um, it just made that a bit less explicit for white people, perhaps, <laughs> is the better way to put it. Um, so in that context uh, in the US, specifically in New York, South Bronx, um, there were people who were engaging with different um, strategies of putting together music, and what I'd like to call this here is they were jamming with technology and community. So they were trying to find ways of um, playing with these new technologies that they had access to, PA systems, which are, you know, speaker systems with an amplifier, 
um, which they would hook up a turntable to, and then they would have multiple turntables, and they would be able to kind of keep a track going forever uh, if they wanted to. So um, I'm just going to actually pull up a video to give you a sense as to what this looked like, and it, they also, uh, the person in the video, Grandmaster Flash, he gives you a bit of an explanation as to um, what jamming with this technology looked like and what it was like to engage with the community in that way. Stolen. Now way back in the days when hip hop began With Coca La Rock, Cool Herc and Dem Fam These boys ran to the latest jam But when it got shot up, they went home and said damn Remember, Bronx River, Rolling Stick With Cool DJ Red Alert and Chuck Chill Out on the mix When Africa Islam was rocking the jam And on the other side of town was a kid named Flash The kid named Flash, Flash So where are we now? Look upstairs, this is um This is where the Dixie Club used to be Dixie Club. Yeah, right here on Freeman Street. It was like after we grew out of the, um, the black door, my manager went searching for a club in the general area. And this was it. It held like about 800 people. Is it still a club? No. It's now Examica Playhouse. In the early day, a DJ used to play a record like from start to finish. And like, you know, which I felt that kind of boring to look at or even to listen to. So what I would do is pick the most climatic part or the strongest part, the funkiest part of the, of the record and just continuously repeat that part over and over again and sync. This is like way before records were, yeah. I mean, even thought about being made, you know, there was no such thing as a recording artist, rapper on a record, so to speak, yeah. you know. What do you have on now? Well, I have one, um... This was a real popular record, you know, in this time, and at this point here, it still is. It's uh, called uh, Bob James 2, Take Me to the Mardi Gras. And I'll just try to, like, take it apart and put it together again. started getting, as they say today, get busy on the turntables, everybody would just stop dancing and just look like as if I was holding class. When <laughs> my main objective was get them out there. I mean, it was like it took me hours to figure out the best part of the record. I master it. I make a program out of like 30 or 40 records, and I'm ready to go out there and kill them with the best part of all these 30 or 40 records, and everybody's just... I needed something to get the people off what it was I was doing and into a party mode. At that time there, playing in the parks with the, with the style of music that we was playing, you had to keep the audience occupied because if you didn't, you know, something, somebody might just get violent. I mean, uh -huh. these things happen, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, from there, that's when um, MCing, it's now, the standard is now called rapping. Mm -hmm. It was called MCing. And um, the rapping and the DJing you know, intertwined together. It worked pretty good. So to summarize Grandmaster Flash, he was shooting for a new musical art form that took the best parts of records and just played those over and over again. But he found that that would be distracting to the audience, even though maybe it captured their attention, um, they would stop dancing, they would stop partying. And the solution to that was the MC, which today we know as, or we'll call a rapper. Um, and so this is the person who engages with the crowd and exerts some sort of crowd control 
um, and gets them dancing, gets them partying. So breaking is the form of dance associated with hip hop music. Um, we don't always call it breaking uh, today, uh, similar to just maybe just hip hop dance, um, but it evolved in response to the DJ and the MC. Um, there, it gets its name from dancing along to the breaks between the records. So when the DJ would, um, you know, restart the record or switch from one to the other, that was often called a break. Um, and it wasn't always perfectly in, in you know, on, it was, wasn't was always perfectly on the beat like a metronome, right? So that was where kind of break somewhat got its name. So lastly, there's graffiti. Graffiti is kind of considered a visual and political manifestation of hip hop culture. Again, we're not going to be covering that very much in, in this course, um, but I can kind of summarize the kind of scholarly perspective on hip hop graffiti by um, telling you a, a, just a little bit about it, which is that it was often... Um, like graffiti often appeared on the New York subways, which you saw at the beginning of that video there. Um, and one scholar writes that these New York City subway trains, um, these graffiti artists, they created a new mass media. And in that sense, they kind of wrote back to the city. So it's, it's a physical, illustrative, political manifestation of hip hop. Um, very interesting in its own right, has a really cool history, um, which is worth checking out. Um, but again, we're going to be focusing mostly on the musical incarnations of hip hop culture throughout this course. Though if you are interested in researching uh, one of these two elements or another element of hip hop culture, you're definitely welcome to talk to me about doing that um, for the second assignment. Okay, so up to this point, we've surveyed the general academic perspectives that we're going to be drawing on throughout this course, and we've sketched out the general contours of hip hop culture. If you haven't already, I'd suggest to maybe just take a break, uh, maybe take a moment to stand up before we get even further into these materials here, um, because at this point we're going to be getting a bit he headier uh, and talking about kind of theories that draw together these really complex um, and conflicting perspectives that are all kind of tangled together in what we're calling hip hop culture. So in Trisha Rose's book, she studies hip hop culture because she says that hip hop culture serves as a cultural, intellectual, and spiritual vessel for the expression of black noise. So when she says black noise, she's advancing, um, a metaphor to understand hip hop culture. So there's two ways to think about what she means by noise. The first one has to do with political resistance. So this goes back to what we were talking about um, in the civil rights era. Uh, obviously, even before then, <laughs> there were forms of resistance, um, though it's it's related to the to that. It's, it's grounded in that, right? So first, noise is used as a metaphor to talk about standing up, you know, making noise, you know, saying that uh, you're not going to like stand up or like stand for some sort of inequality. You're going to make noise. You're going to say that you're proud of your identity. You're not going to, um, yeah, stand down. You know, that's that's an important aspect, and that relates back to um, an image I had up earlier, which I didn't mention explicitly, but that James Brown song, you know. Uh, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. That's like an important aspect of making noise. So it's both the political resistance side and also just um, the identity side, which feeds into another form of noise, which is the sense that it's hard to kind of go into hip hop culture and then leave with a unified idea as to what it is, uh, what's the you know ideal value, because there are multiple and they're in conflict. And one of the reasons for this just has to do with the practical reality is that hip hop culture is used to express marginalized experiences in America, but it takes very seriously the identity of the people who are expressing um, that and, as, and which is wrapped up in their neighborhood and their friends and their family and you know their, their social networks. So in that sense, there are debates within hip hop culture, which is another form of noise, right? So these are kind of the two sides of what Trisha Rose means when she talks about black noise. 
Um, and so I think one concept that's helpful, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a bit of a <laughs> mouthful, but it does capture what she is going for. Polyvocality. So it means that there's not one unified interpretation among, uh, of, you know, hip, the uh, so social events, police brutality, poverty, family, uh, other themes like that within the hip hop community. Obviously there's like some consensus when it comes to, uh, you know, values, uh, aspirations, but you know, the process of getting there, people don't necessarily agree on that. I want to provide an example now, um, which will help to kind of put some more flesh on that Watkins reading. So Public Enemy is a really interesting uh, group in the history of hip hop. And I think that they kind of provide like a microcosm of what Trisha Rose is talking about when she talks about the like black noise in the sense of, you know, stating some sort of political resistance, which was covered pretty well in um, the Watkins article, but also not necessarily agreeing with one another. So I'm going to throw over to a clip from a documentary and we'll come back and talk about it. Public Enemy uh, had a kind of built-in instability. You've got Flavor and Griff in the same band. It made no sense. It's never made any sense. And the fact that they managed to do anything together with these two guys, these two polar opposite character types in the same band, completely miraculous. Uh, yeah, I've never smoked, never took a drink. I wasn't the party type, straight lace, so to speak. It's gonna be better than the sweet ghetto. <laughs> so now I'm meeting this dude. Was Flay was Chuck's friend, who's stealing cars, selling drugs, doing drugs, doing all this kind of stuff, and then now I have to partner up with this guy and manage that. Yo, man, we was in this shop. The Terminator showed me these things. I said, well, "I'm gonna get them." And I got them. Uh, the dude never owned a set of luggage. He had plastic bags with his clothes and deodorant and toothbrush and socks and underwear in, like about 15 bags. Like Griff. Chuck and the S1Ws didn't smoke, drink, or do drugs. By the time Nation of Millions hit the charts, Flavor Flav was into all of them. Tonight, tonight is the night Flavor's gonna fuck up because I'm fucked up. You know what I'm saying? I was fucked up, you know what I'm saying? Oh, what kind of example are you to young black men that we trying to set an example for? You're doing everything opposite of what we're trying to do. We're trying to save our people, but you, we got to drag you out of the crack house. Anytime that I ever got with my group, I was always functionable. I have never was a dysfunctional addict or dysfunctional addict. You, 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 come on, Rico. I didn't do nothing. No, you are doing something as just as you speak because you got those dark glasses on. You're spilling orange juice all on me because oh. it's all over you. Oh, uh, you're wrong again. <laughs> the only thing that I say that drugs did to me was it made me miss some of my shows. All right, so in that um, documentary footage of Public Enemy, you can see that there's a clearly a conflict between Flavor Flav and... Uh, Professor Griff, in the sense that Professor Griff's clearly a very straight edge or straight laced <laughs> uh, kind of person, whereas Flavor Flav is more kind of free spirited. Um, and they both very clearly articulate their positions and why they're valuable, right? Um, and so, relating this back to Trisha Rose's concept of black noise, the value of being able to take perhaps contradictory points of view. Um, with this one concept is that it shows how rap culture or hip hop culture um, isn't absent of intellectual clarity. In fact, these kind of different contradictory articulations are a common feature of community and popular cultural dialogues that always offer more than one um, cultural, social, or political viewpoint. Um, and this relates again back to the Watkins reading when he talks about what public enemy does is bridge an understanding of youth disillusionment and alienation, um, but also the politics of pleasure, which are not always in um, sync together, right? Like you can't always 
you you won't be able to achieve some sort of emancipatory social movement that requires you know social change and uh, social mobilization well um, prioritizing like hedonism though these two things do exist in in hip-hop culture and again it seems contradictory although it's part of a um, what Trisha Rose was describing as like this is just a regular feature of um, cultural dialogues that are important. Okay, so so far we've covered the noisiness of political resistance, the noisiness of a lively community dialogue, um, but then there's a third form of noisiness that I think is worth considering when we talk about black noise and hip-hop culture, and that's the influence of cultural industries. So the metaphor I'm going to use here is that cultural industries in the, you know, in the sense of like major record labels, people who are looking to really profit off of culture, what they do is they generally um, tend to repackage the most popular versions of things, relying on stereotypes and, you know, extremes. And so I would describe this as kind of distorting. Um, I, don't, I know that there's a few musicians out there. If you put on a distortion pedal on your guitar, you know, or your vocals, it just really kind of augments it uh, and, and, and it gets that grainy sound. Um, if you think of uh, Revolution by the uh, Beatles, that track, uh, the guitar is like highly distorted. And so in that sense, this noise metaphor can, use, can work to talk about how cultural industries take um, some sort of cultural product or genre and then distort it and find its, um, like enhance its most salient characteristics, right? And so in that sense, there's, that introduces a new form of noisiness, right? Like you need to kind of read beneath the surface to be like, oh, okay, this music video was created within the context of a cultural industry. There are these experiences that are being articulated, but there's also these other things which um, perhaps aren't necessarily part of the artist's point of view, but are valued by people in the cultural industry who are trying to profit off of this. This um, kind of aspect of black noise, um, well, actually, uh, all of them, <laughs> will come up again uh, next week when we talk about the hip-hop wars, because uh, when uh, we talk about the hip-hop wars, we're talking about conflicts at various lines um, within hip-hop culture. Okay, so I hope that that makes clearer the various things that Trisha Rose is talking about when she terms hip-hop culture black noise. All three of these, uh, all three aspects of this metaphor are going to be relevant again next week when we talk about the hip-hop wars uh, in the sense of noise as political resistance, um, noise as a lively community uh, conversation, and noise as something that's uh, distorted um, and exaggerated. All right, so let's get into the final reading we will cover in today's lecture. So Jennifer Lena is a sociologist of music. She's contributed a lot to the sociology of hip hop. Um, we will be reading one more of her articles later on in this semester, but this is her general theoretical statement. She's done so much work throughout her career to understand um, genres from a sociological perspective. So. In sociology, going all the way back to, you know, Durkheim, we're interested in how do people kind of hold categories in their head? What, how do they distinguish things um, and, and group them together, right? How do we know who's a blues artist and who's a rock artist? Who's a gangsta rapper and who's, I don't know, a mumble rapper, right? These categories seem pretty intuitive and, um, you know, self-explanatory until you start looking at them from a sociological perspective and understand that these categories are actually maintained by social institutions and social processes. So what are those institutions and social processes? Well, let's start with the social processes because what we can do is work our way through these isomorphic genre forms to kind of just get a sense as to where and when we would apply these concepts. So avant-garde genres, musical genres, usually emerge um, within a small group of people. Typically, they are responding to um, 
popular forms of culture and trying to do something that's alternative to that. The social processes that are really important here have to usually to do with just like friendship and, you know, some sort of um, aspiration to make some sort of change, right, to some sort of genre. There's not a lot of economic resources. The artists are typically kind of paying their, their investing um, in this new genre art form. The social resources are usually fairly limited. People are usually fairly resistant to new genre forms. And there's not a lot of pre prestige, you know, uh, so that's what I mean by these symbolic resources. So, you know, jazz, when it first came out, was very devalued. It was just kind of considered like this noisy music. Um, and then over time, it's become a very prestigious form of music. So it used to have very little in the way of symbolic resources, um, you know, in the early 20th century. And now um, it's established as a highbrow kind of art form. If people start to be convinced by this new kind of avant-garde musical form, you know, more economic resources come in. Um, people start to offer support <laughs> uh, and social networks start to grow. Then a genre can change into a scene-based genre. So we see this with hip hop music after kind of the general style had been defined, like we were talking about with, um, um, as uh, Grandmaster Flash was mentioning, describe, uh, figuring out how to um, layer uh, music over top of each other and to continually keep playing the best parts of the record. Um, so in what kind of came together there um, was, you know, Grandmaster Flash, he contributed a uh, special mixer um, to, for that purpose. Uh, DJ Cool Herc had the uh, PA system that made it so loud and Africa Bambata had a huge uh, record collection. And so those three things kind of coalesced into what we would describe as the, you know, hip hop music style. Like I was saying, now there's more people on board, there's more social connections in the neighborhood. Uh, maybe some local businesses are helping to produce, you know, merchandise or advertise the shows, things like that. Then it becomes more scene based. Um, and so, there's some really good examples of this in early hip hop when you're looking at um, the different scenes that were emerging in the New York boroughs. And there's some really interesting um, history there, which we'll get into shortly. So once scenes are fairly established, people are interested, the industry can take over. And this is uh, when, you know, major labels start investing, uh, start buying up, um, Minor, uh, minor labels? <laughs> Independent labels. Um, and there's a lot of money to be made. And, and they invest, you know, usually it's a, a big institution invests a lot of money and then the, it just explodes and there's tons of money to be made. That is the basic kind of definition of an industry based genre, one that's very profitable. Um, and then finally, there is traditionalist uh, genres. And so the kind of classic example of this would be like folk music. There's not a ton of money in it. That's kind of what differentiates it from um, the industry-based genre is that it is very um, widespread. So it's not scene-based, it's not local. Um, there is a general sort of tradition here, but there is not a ton of money to be made. And when there are, you know, events that are devoted to a traditionalist genre. They're not usually very profitable. There's usually music societies that are, that are uh, funding them that kind of keep them alive. And so as Jennifer Lena describes in her book, hip hop has gone through its avant-garde phase, as you can see here with this photo um, of a mixing session in the Bronx in the 1970s. Um, and then it transitioned into its scene-based phase where the conventions became codified and there became local styles developed once uh, music industries invested and hip-hop has become very profitable it's now an industry-based genre she doesn't say that it's become a traditional um, genre and the reason for this is because it is still so profitable if you know hip-hop it one day becomes you know unprofitable and people stop buying it people stop listening to it on a kind of mass scale 
Um, in that sense, then there probably will be traditional society, like societies of hip hop culture that will pop up and maintain it. But um, based on her typology, because it is so profitable, it doesn't count as a traditionalist genre yet. Um, and so, uh, yeah, since we're still kind of um, talking about early hip hop, like basically right when the industry uh, got kicked off and, and really established. That's why I just kind of wanted to throw this image of the Odd Future um, group, because uh, especially this one, it reminds me of like the Andy Warhol kind of like industrial patterns and, and art. So I think that that's relevant to talk about. Once it became an industry, it stayed an industry. And, um, you know, it's evolved over time, but it has kind of, it's maintained that status uh, if we're going to take Jennifer Lena's thought seriously. So that concludes all of the content that I wanted to cover for today's lecture. I do look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Um, feel free to post those in the discussion thread for this week. Getting to the end of this lecture now, um, I'm kind of realizing what this, what recording a lecture <laughs> asynchronously feels like. And I do have to say it does feel kind of weird not to know how you're reacting to what I'm saying. So um, please feel free to, to let me know if things are clear or if they're not. Hopefully we can continue the discussion in the course uh, discussion thread. Um, and yeah, so I look forward to chatting with you online and my office hours are going to be on Friday from 12 until 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, so Toronto time. All right, great. Well, I look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you then or to talking with you online. All right, take care and have a good week.